the Commerce and Justice Departments, as well as for science programs, including NASA. The bill provides $51 billion in discretionary spending, a 3% decrease from this year and 2% less than the president requested. Senate, meanwhile, voting now on whether to move forward on a bill to keep federal student loan rates at 3.4%. That's live on C-SPAN 2. Now to the House Live here on C-SPAN. Probably offered by our chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. We thank you once again that we, your creatures, can come before you and ask guidance for the men and women of this assembly. Send your spirit of wisdom as they enter into a difficult week to consider the appropriations needed for so many agencies charged with administering the various functions of government serving the citizens of the United States. Please keep all the members of this Congress and all who work for the People's House in good health, that they might faithfully fulfill the great responsibility given them by the people of this great nation. Bless us this day and every day May all that is done here this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House's approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 1, Rule 1, I demand a vote on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the journal is approved. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, I demand. Dollar, Pennsylvania. Mr. Speaker, I demand the yeas and nays. Uh, the yeas and nays are requested pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20. Further proceedings on this question are postponed. The gentleman uh, from Pennsylvania will lead the House in the Pledge of Allegiance. Speaker, I ask the guests in the gallery to please join us in saying the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one-minute speeches on each side. For what pur purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, on the back of today's Wall Street Journal, which I have in my hands, has featured a shocking story about pills coming from China containing human flesh. South Korean authorities intercepted tens of thousands of capsules and confirmed that they were composed of ground-up pieces of aborted fetuses and marketed as stamina boosters. This horror again reiterates why we should be concerned with pharmaceuticals coming from mainland China. These human flesh capsules are both abhorrent and a threat to health, possibly containing super bacteria. It is revolting to discover that there are individuals in China who will attempt to pass off such an abomination as medicine. The journal goes on to note that it was just last month that regulators cracked down on pills from China containing high amounts of chromium, a known carcinogen. Today's grim news reminds us to be vigilant in protecting the safety of our drug supply chain and to carefully monitor health products coming from China. These pills are a terrible affront to human dignity and a serious danger to health. I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, unless Congress acts, millions of students will see their student loan interest rates double from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent on July 1st of this year. This issue is important to students, parents, teachers, and businesses all across my home state of Rhode Island. It will result in more than 43,000 students paying more than 40, 34 million dollars in additional interest costs. We must act on this issue. But some in this chamber have put partisanship ahead of good public policy and proposed ex extending these rates by cutting funding for preventive health care. Today, the Senate will vote on a cloture for a bill that would extend low interest student loans by closing a tax loophole. I'd like to especially thank our state senior senator, Jack Reed, for his leadership in highlighting this issue on the Senate side 
and making sure that Congress acts in the best interests of working families. And I urge my colleagues in the House to reconsider their course of action and to not propose a false choice between the welfare of our young people and public health. We owe it to our young people to ensure that we prevent these rates from doubling. I thank the Speaker and yield back the balance of my time. What purpose does the gentleman from Maryland rise? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise today and urge my colleagues to join me in saluting the 150th Heritage Celebration of what is now known as the Great Frederick Fair of Frederick County, Maryland, and I've been attending it now for a third of its life for 50 years. It will take place May 19 to 20 at the event plex at the Frederick Fairgrounds. Our Civil War and influenza outbreaks were among the events which precluded consecutive exhibitions since the inception of the first fair with competitions and exhibitions of livestock and other entries organized by the Frederick County Agricultural Society in 1821. The first such event was entitled the Cattle Show and Fair and was held on May 23 and 24 in 20, 1822 at George Krieger's Tavern at Bonacacy Bridge. Today, the Frederick County Agricultural Society still exists with 250 life members. The next venture was the Farmers Club organized on November 22, 1849, which then held an exhibition where the Maryland School for the Deaf now stands on October 12 to 14, 1853. The present site of the Frederick Fair was purchased at 797 East Patrick Street in the early 1900s. Construction began with the grandstand in 1911, which is still used today. The Great Frederick Fair is a testament to the ongoing contributions of farmers to the economy and civic life of Frederick County, Maryland. You need to come. It's the best fair in Maryland. Thank you. And I yield back. What, what purpose does the lady from California rise? So ordered. Mr. Speaker, I've been a member of Congress for almost a year now, and in that time I don't think anyone would accuse me of not trying uh, to be bipartisan. I enjoy uh, my Republican friends. I like working together to get things done, but bipartisanship uh, does not equal silence, and budgets are a reflection of our values and the Republican Reconciliation Budget Bill coming to the floor this week runs contrary to everything I believe in. The Republican budget makes drastic cuts to schools, to health care, to investment in our children's future, and it also guts valuable programs like the Meals on Wheels for our seniors. Yet it does not ask for a single contribution from the wealthiest among us, nor the most profitable corporations in the world. Being a friend means being able to tell them when they're wrong. And to my Republican friends, this budget doesn't reflect who we are as a nation. It's wrong. Thank you. Who seeks recognition? New York. For what purpose the gentleman? So ordered. Mr. Speaker, in a devastating trend, the Centers for Disease Control is calling a public health epidemic. Prescription drug deaths rates have, in the United States have more than tripled, more than tripled since 1990. In a strange twist of fate, addictive, addictive prescription painkillers are killing our children, causing a lifetime of pain for and grief for stricken parents. This week, the parents of Michael David Israel join other parents on Capitol Hill to call for changes to prevent these tragedies. The Centers for Disease Control is recommending the implementation of prescription drug monitoring programs, state-run electronic databases used to track the dispensing of controlled drugs to patients. States must move uh, quickly to implement this technology, and the federal government should support this common sense transition to electronic medical records. Avi and Julie Israel and other parents in Washington this week have shown amazing strength despite unthinkable sorrow. Their pain will never be relieved, but we have an obligation to move quickly to save the Michaels of the world. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut? Without objection, so ordered.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on July 2nd, we will celebrate the 150th anniversary of President Abraham Lincoln's signing of the Morrill Act, a federal mandate for every state to establish a land-grant college. What an inspiring example. In the darkest days of the Civil War, we had leaders who understood that making college a national priority was too important to be ignored. Sadly, the day before that anniversary, July 1st, 53 days from today, we risk breaking faith with that vision when Stafford student loan interest rates double from 3.4% to 6.8%. For three months, I have, been, I have put forth a bipartisan bill with over 150 co-sponsors to permanently fix this problem, yet all we have gotten from the Republican leadership is a Band-Aid bill that is a dead letter cynically wiping out a fund to prevent cancer, heart disease, and diabetes to pay for only one year of student loan relief. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, the American people are smarter than that. They want a real bill paid for fairly that helps students, not fearful politicians. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Ohio rise? Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right now, student loan debt is higher than credit card debt for the first time in history. College costs are growing each year, forcing students to take out more loans to get the same education, an education that gives them the key to the middle class. And the Republican response? Play political games that could result in interest rate hikes from 3.4% to 6.8% on July 1st for student loans affecting over 7 million students, making the average graduate pay an additional $1,000 in interest payments each year if rates are allowed to double. Ohio students alone will end up paying nearly $300 million in extra interest payments over the next year. Recent graduates have high unemployment rates and are the least prepared to deal with these increased payments. But House Republicans are content to plunge them deeper into debt while instead fighting for more tax breaks for millionaires, too many of whom pay at lower rates than the middle class. It's time for Republicans to come to the table and compromise. It seems logical that Congress would not stand in the way of making college more affordable by doubling the interest rate of college loans. The Republican Party in this House is not acting logically. What a crying shame. What purpose does the gentlelady from Washington, D.C. rise? Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when the President alerted the country that student loan interest rates would double July 1st, our Republican friends called it a fake controversy. Uh, they always intended to take care of it. Why then was it nowhere to be found in the Republican Ryan budget? Why, why do they want to pay for it with the parents and grandparents health care of the class of 2012. This year's graduates will graduate into an employment rate for their age group that is twice the national average. Keeping their loan rates low should be this session's no-brainer. If student loan rates go to 6.8 percent, uh, they will be paying above mortgage rates for many. Treasury is lending at virtually zero. Congress has not given the class of 2012 a jobs bill. One graduation gift we can give them is their 3.4% interest rate. What purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise in recognition of National Teacher Appreciation Day. Let us honor all of those teachers for their passion and dedication to educating America's future. Today, I'd like to recognize Mrs. Pam Cray, a resident of the district that I get to represent who has dedicated her life to education. Before launching her Anaheim Union High School District career as an administrator for 25 years, she taught at all levels in the Anaheim City School District. Mrs. Cray has said that the single most important thing we can do for our students is to create a place for high levels of learning that is safe, caring and focused on developing the academic and social skills that they can take to whatever their goals and dreams may be. 
In addition to serving as principal, Mrs. Cray also serves the community of Anaheim in Orange County. She is an active member of the Anaheim Police Chief's Advisory Board, the Cops for Kids Board, and the Youth Leadership of America. She has received numerous awards throughout the years. Mrs. Cray will be retiring at the end of this academic year as principal from the very school where she attended as a teenager. I encourage everyone to thank their teachers today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. For what purposes, gentlemen from Rhode Island, seek permit? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, Democrats are committed to reducing the deficit in a balanced way. In contrast, the Republicans will bring up a bill this week that breaks our bipartisan agreement, erasing the hard work on both sides uh, to reach a compromise. This was the agreement that resulted in us allowing to erase the, the debt ceiling. It put in place the super committee that could have reached uh, a more balanced approach to budgeting both, with both revenues and uh, budget cuts, but my Republican colleagues rejected uh, increased revenues that were needed. And this simply wasn't a, uh, a, uh, a gentleman's agreement that was arrived at as a result of it that's going to put in place sequester. This compromise was signed uh, into law as a pledge to each other and to the nation to work together to solve our most challenging issues. Republicans are reneging on that agreement. They've decided that cutting the programs which would help heat my constituents' homes, put food on their tables, and send their children to college is the right approach to rebuilding a strong economy. They've decided that denying health coverage to thousands of Americans is better than repealing tax cuts to millionaires. They've decided that going it alone is more important than working with Democrats. Well, Democrats have a plan to put our fiscal house back in order. It's been, in play, it's been uh, 500 days since the GOP took over, and we're still waiting for theirs. We can do better, and I, and I urge them to work with us. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Maryland rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, once again, Republicans are going to pass a budget reconciliation that gives tax breaks to the wealthiest Americans, big oil, and companies that ship American jobs overseas. And the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities says that this Tea Party budget that gives away $3 trillion would provide those making over a million dollars a year with an average tax cut of $394,000 a year. And how do the Republicans pay for this little bonus? Well, that's right, Mr. Speaker. They do it by ending the Medicare guarantee, by balancing their budget on the backs of the middle class and America's most vulnerable, our seniors, our women, and our children. It means that 326,000 women will lose breast cancer screenings, 300,000 fewer children will be without health insurance, and 1.7 million seniors are going to go without meal on wheels. This Tea Party budget is an embarrassment. And I have to tell you, we can all do better, and Democrats know that because we support a balanced approach that creates jobs and expands opportunity. Republicans ought to know better. Actually, Mr. Speaker, they ought to do better by honoring the American people. What purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii rise? Speaker, I request unanimous consent to address the House in one minute. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, the Senate is now debating the Stafford loan or the student loan bill, their version. And their version is better because their version pays for it by closing loopholes, big tax loopholes. It requires us to now look at what the House passed. We paid for a one-year extension by repealing the preventative health care provisions. What does that mean? It means that women and children will suffer. For my state, Mr. Speaker, it meant that the state preventative grants will be gone. And that's what we need to prevent heart attacks, to address the concerns of particular women and children and those who are in need. But what does it mean when we let this, this, this interest rate go up? For me, it's 16,681 students. Average loans of $4,000 plus, total in the state of $67 million plus. This is going to be an additional $16 million to them. Mr. Speaker, we can do better. I yield back the balance of my time. What purposes, gentlemen? From Kentucky, rise. With permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection, so ordered. 
Mr. Speaker, most of us remember a teacher who made us look at the world a little differently, introduced us to a new idea, or changed the way we thought. For me, that teacher was Betty Miles. For two years at Atherton High School in Louisville, my English teacher introduced me to an entire universe of thought and language, and I am forever grateful. Across the country, millions of people like Betty Miles are introducing young Americans to new concepts that will stick with them for a lifetime. Their work is critical for our most fundamental national interest, to build and maintain a strong and vibrant economy and to remain at the forefront of global innovation and ideas. And their daily sacrifices on behalf of growing generations are nothing short of heroic. Much in the way teachers change the lives of, other, of their students, their voices also shape debate in Washington. As we consider the future of public education in this country, we must also continue to hear from those on the ground to better address the challenges facing our school systems. Mr. Speaker, today on National Teacher Day, I encourage everyone to not only thank their teachers, but to ask them this essential question, how can we do better? I yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we don't act um, within the next 53 days, uh, what we're going to see is the student loan interest rate double from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent for more than 7.5 uh, million students. And I understand that basically that means that a student would rack up an additional thousand dollars in debt each year that the student interest rate stayed uh, at the 3 percent. Um, I mean at the 7 percent instead of the 3 percent. The fact of the matter is we have to do something about this. Now, you know, I had uh, last week during our, uh, our uh, district office week, I, I went to Rutgers University, Mr. Speaker, and I met with the students. They were in the middle of their final exams. They reject outright this Republican idea that we should take money from a women's or children's health care from the prevention fund to pay for this. There's got to be a better way of do it that, doing it that we must approach on a bipartisan basis. But I heard the stories at Rutgers about the students and how much debt, crushing debt they had. Not only those who were, uh, had the debt from their undergraduate days, but also many students who have to go on to graduate school or law school or medical school and accumulate even more debt. We need to address this problem immediately with regard to the student interest rate. We've got to keep it low. But we also have to address the larger issue of college affordability over the long term. There has to be more money for student loans and for grants. College affordability is something we need to address in a major way, Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 643 and ask for its immediate consideration. The Clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 129, House Resolution 643, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 5326, making appropriations for the Departments of Commerce and Justice, Science and Related Agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2013, and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. Points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair of the Committee of the Whole may accord priority and recognition on the basis of whether the member offering an amendment has caused it to be printed in the portion of the Congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18. Amendments so printed shall be considered as read. When the committee rises and reports the bill back to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass, the previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. 
House Resolution 614 is amended in Section 2A by inserting and the allocations of spending authority printed in Tables 11 and 12 of House Report 112-421 shall be considered for all purposes in the House to be the allocations under Section 302A of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 before the period. Section 3, the requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee on Rules on the same day it is presented to the House is waived with respect to any resolution reported on May 10th, 2012, providing for consideration or disposition of any measure reported by the Committee on the Budget relating to Section 201 of House Concurrent Resolution 12, 112. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one hour. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, Mr. Hastings, from uh, Florida, and I'd like to yield uh, uh, the gentleman, for the purpose of debate only, uh, the customary 30 minutes. So ordered. The uh, pending which time, uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself uh, such time as I may consume. The, and all, all time yielded today is just for the purpose of debate Gentlemen's only. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, when I, I always look around when I hear someone, when I hear the, the reading clerk reading the, the rule, because I can't tell if folks are glossing over or if, if, if they're excited about it, like I am. And if, if you paid close attention to the reading clerk this morning, Mr. Speaker, you're excited about it. You're excited about it because we're here to do the first appropriations bill of the FY 2013 cycle. Now, Mr. Speaker, as you know, there's about two-thirds of the budget uh, that is the mandatory spending, that budget that, that gets spent whether Congress shows up to work or not. It just is money that gets borrowed from our children and goes right out the door. This one-third of the budget, this uh, discretionary spending uh, side, uh, is the part that doesn't go out the door unless the House comes together and, and passes uh, a bill, sends it to the Senate, gets the Senate to pass a bill, and it goes to the President's desk for signature. This is the first of those bills that we're going to have a chance uh, to do in this, in this Congress. And as we began the year last year, we're going to begin the year this year with an open rule. Mr. Speaker, as, as you know, an open rule allows any member of this body to bring any idea that they have and offer it as an amendment to the underlying bill. You don't have to be a high-ranking Republican to get an amendment to this bill. You don't have to be a senior Democrat to get an amendment to this bill. You just have to be a representative of constituents back home. And you can show up on this floor and have a say. This is going to be Congress at its best, Mr. Speaker. When you hear it read, it sounds like a lot of legalistic uh, mumbo-jumbo, but when you see it in action, it is this House as our Founding Fathers intended this House to be. This is House Resolution 643, Mr. Speaker, and it is an open rule for consideration of H.R. 5326, the FY13 Commerce Justice State Appropriations Bill. You know, last year, Mr. Speaker, we only got through six and a half of the appropriations bills uh, in this uh, House uh, before it became apparent the process was gonna, going to break down and we went to a minibus to finish the, finish the deal. But we considered 350 amendments, 350 different ideas, Mr. Speaker, 350 lines that came from the, the body right here that said we have a better way than what the committee has reported to us. Now this is a, a special day, as my colleague from Florida knows, because this appropriations bill passed out of subcommittee by a voice vote. A voice vote. Democrats, Republicans came together in subcommittee, passed this uh, bill, sent it on to full committee, where again, Mr. Speaker, Democrats and Republicans came together to pass out of full committee this bill on a voice vote, and now we bring it to the House floor today. Goodness knows, we may be able to pass this rule on voice vote, I say to my colleague from, from Florida, and perhaps the underlying legislation as well. This is the House working as the folks back home intended the House to work. Now, this is funding for the Commerce Department, Mr. Speaker. All of those programs intended to grow jobs in this country, to promote trade in this country, Commerce Department funded under this bill. This is the bill that funds the Justice Department, funds our U.S. Marshals, funds our FBI, funds those parts of, of our uh, society that we know need special attention, Mr. Speaker, in, in these uh, difficult times. 
This is the bill that funds NASA, Mr. Speaker. This is the bill that funds the National Science Foundation. This is the bill that funds the U.S. Trade Representative and the International Trade Commission. Mr. Speaker, I'll quote the subcommittee chairman, Frank Wolf, who said this legislation builds on significant spending reductions achieved in last year's bill while continuing to preserve core priorities. Those priorities continue to be job creation, fighting crime and terrorism with a focus on cybersecurity, and boosting U.S. competitiveness through smart investments in science. This bill makes job creation a priority by maintaining and expanding manufacturing and job repatriation initiatives. Mr. Speaker, these are tough times. I don't know if you've seen all the young people out, uh, outside uh, this chamber today, Mr. Speaker, folks uh, in town with their schools, folks in town uh, visiting Washington, D.C. You know, 40 cents out of every dollar that this chamber spends, Mr. Speaker, we borrow from those children. We heard lots of one minute this morning about the student loan program. Of course, every penny that goes out the door is a penny that we borrowed from the next uh, generation of Americans. This bill passed out of subcommittee and full committee on a voice vote, represents a 1% reduction from the President's request in this title. 1%. A lot of folks in this body would like it to be more than 1%. I suspect we'll have some amendments on this floor during this wonderful open amendment process that will, in fact, uh, try to change that number to be greater than 1%. But what folks came together to say is these are priorities for this country. These are important funding priorities that only the national and the federal government can do. So we want to fund those in a responsible way that both focuses on not borrowing from the next generation, but still maintaining important core priorities uh, that I think we will all agree uh, are important to, the, to this federal government. Mr. Speaker, with that, I'd like to reserve uh, the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Chair Rick, for what purposes does uh, the gentleman from Florida rise? Mr. Speaker, I've been yielded time graciously by my friend, and I'm prepared to uh, use that time. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume. And uh, again, I thank my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Woodall. Uh, for yielding me the customary uh, uh, 30 minutes. I also appreciated his comments about the fact that we are borrowing from the next generation. I gather that the previous generation borrowed from us. I don't know when the borrowing stops, but at least uh, that seems to be the way of the world until we get uh, to a point where we can be self-sustaining as rightly we should be. Uh, this rule provides for consideration of uh, commerce, justice, science appropriations for fiscal year 2013. Many of my Republican colleagues have been patting themselves on the back for the open rule associated with this bill. Um, and they claim that this effort demonstrates transparency and their commitment to regular uh, order. Putting aside from the moment, or for the moment, whether a single open rule in 304 days for an open legislation process, or uh, the fact is uh, that now the Republicans are using this rule to correct a mistake they made in their previous effort to deem and pass the Ryan budget. It seems, Mr. Speaker, that the deem and pass didn't work the first time around, and it was supposed to break the spending agreement made by uh, uh, my friends in the Republican Party in the Budget Control Act, but they bungled that effort a couple of weeks ago and now have to try to go back on their word. Seems to me that if you're going to break an agreement that you made in good faith, you ought to get it right the first time. Uh, doing this twice just calls attention to what little regard there is for bipartisan cooperation and agreement. And I heard my colleague 
uh, uh, Mr. Woodall, comment about this coming out of um, uh, the uh, subcommittee and the committee by voice vote, and there is no disagreement in that regard. And I guess to uh, some uh, that is to be a commendable uh, effort. But he also suggested that we may very well, if we were to choose, carry this on voice vote, I would disabuse him of that notion that is not going to happen. Uh, the demon pass was wrong the first time around, and is still wrong the second time around, and shouldn't have been placed in here, and it will be wrong the third, fourth, and however many more times around there are, in spite of open rules, if you put it in it, until the Republicans have repudiated every last promise uh, they made. If breaking the Budget Control Act agreement wasn't enough, uh, the Republican majority is also using this rule to silence members on the upcoming reconciliation legislation being considered by this body later this week. Rather than using regular order, and I stick a tack in that to compliment uh, my colleague um, on the Rules Committee, who does believe and has made it manifestly clear that he believes in regular order. Uh, but rather than using regular order to debate uh, the merits of breaking uh, their promises, Republicans are imposing martial law to prevent members from properly considering um, uh, the legislation and having their say. Forcing same-day consideration, that's what we mean when we say martial law of the legislation, simply reinforces um, uh, the majority's intent to use this legislation for partisan gain. Instead of working with Democrats on a bipartisan process, Republicans want to jeopardize funding for essential government programs so they can both go back on their agreements and force the House uh, to consider the legislation sight unseen. This is an unfortunate situation because Democrats would have been pleased to support this open rule. Had the Republicans followed regular order, Democrats would support this rule, and I, for one, would argue that we should do so by voice if it had been that way. And if the Budget Committee Democrats end up taking the entire three days that they are entitled to under the rules of the House before they finish their views, we could consider the reconciliation bill on Monday instead of Thursday. This is no way to run a budget process and no way to conduct the business of the House. I'd be amused at the Republicans' uh, failed efforts here, Mr. Speaker, except that I'm dismayed to point out that millions of Americans depend on the programs considered under the appropriations process. An agreement was made with the Budget Control Act, and under the agreement, the Republicans promised certain levels of funding for essential programs. That funding is now in jeopardy because the majority wants to spend time trying to go back on what they promised. Let me remind this body that the House and Senate both passed the Budget Control Act. The Senate has not passed um, uh, the Ryan budget. And deeming and passing does nothing but force this body, as I say all the time, to pretend that the budget as offered is in effect. As I said in the Rules Committee, when the Republicans tried to do this the first time around, if we're going to pass legislation that pretends things exist, then I guess we don't need either the Senate or the President of the United States so we can just pretend that the laws have passed, when in fact they have not. I don't have my copy of I'm Just a Bill, and my colleague wasn't here when I read it in committee at one point in time, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't mention that the way to pass legislation is to first pass one agreement and then try twice uh, to pretend it never happened. I don't know what that looks like in a cartoon version, but probably less like Schoolhouse Rock and more like 
wild E. coyote falling straight off a cliff. Because if we're going to get out of the business of reality and into the business of pretending, let's just pretend that every American has a job, that every student can go to college, and that no child goes to bed hungry. Let's pretend that the billions we wasted on unnecessary wars were instead actually invested right here in the United States of America. Let's pretend uh, that Thanksgiving is in June and Christmas is in July and the election season is over and the deficit is gone. And since we've now pretended that everything is fine in our great country, let's go tell all of the unemployed, the middle class, the hungry, and the poor that their problems aren't real. Or better yet, let's just pretend those people don't exist because that's exactly what I believe the majority's budget does. Rather than using the power of the federal budget to lead this country into a new era of economic growth, Republicans want to cut taxes for those that are wealthy among us, including those of us that serve in the House of Representatives, cut services for everyone else, and then feel like they've set the country on the right track. Instead of spending our time debating the merits of the appropriations legislation before us, we're again trying to convince the majority to stick with the promises they made in the first place, rather than uniting in bipartisan fashion to support an open and transparent legislative process Republicans are using partisan gimmickry to silence debate. Rather than debating this legislation under the Budget Control Act, we have to debate whether the Republican majority should even have to keep their promises. And rather than considering whether the inadequate levels of funding in this legislation, particularly in certain arenas, let me use one in the COPS uh, program, that I thought it was wrong when Democrats cut that program, and I think it's wrong now that Republicans are talking about less money for a, po a program that all of us know is desperately needed in our various uh, communities. We have to consider um, uh, uh, doing more for struggling Americans, and we have to consider whether we ought to be uh, cutting even more, as my colleagues uh, would have it. I reserve the balance of, of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, George is recognized. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection, so they, And Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you, I don't actually prepare remarks when I come down here to, to sit opposite my friend from Florida, because I always know his opening statement is going to be that, that line by line by line that reminds me of absolutely everything that I want to say. And in generally speaking, it reminds me of absolutely everything I'm proud of, and it, it, it is sometimes things that my friend from Florida uh, wishes had not happened. You know, folks ask me back home, Mr. Speaker, I'm a, I'm a freshman uh, here, they say, Rob, what have you learned uh, in your first uh, term in Congress? And I say, what I have learned is that when you watch the House floor on C-SPAN, it looks like theater. And what I've learned is that the comments from my friends on the other side of the aisle, it's not theater at all. It is heartfelt belief in absolutely every word that comes out of their mouth. And, and that's instructive, because if it were theater, we could go into a dark back room somewhere and try to sort it out around the edges. But when it's heartfelt belief about what direction we ought to take this country, it requires the full and open hearing that we give it here on the House floor. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know if you were uh, here for the demon pass uh, of the budget uh, several Congresses uh, ago before I was, was elected, but the gentleman's absolutely right. Uh, deeming a budget uh, as being passed by both houses of Congress is a terrible way to run this institution. He is absolutely right. Now, I'm proud that he and I did not shirk our responsibilities. We passed a budget here in this House under yet another open process. We asked any member, any member of this House that had an idea about what the budget ought to look like in this country to bring that budget to the floor of this House, and we'd have a vote and a debate on it. And we did. And we passed a budget here in the House of Representatives. Now, sadly, our friends on the Senate side have chosen for the third year in a row not to pass a budget. And I would say again, uh, those areas on which we agree, Mr. Speaker, uh, the gentleman's absolutely right. 
in the absence of actually having a budget that has passed the Senate, and, and not just because they haven't passed one, Mr. Speaker, but because they have said affirmatively, and apparently with some pride, they do not plan on passing a budget. So what's the responsible body here on the other side of the, of the Capitol uh, supposed to do? Well, what we said is we need to move forward with our appropriations process, and so we are going to move forward under the budget that has passed this entire U.S. House of Representatives. Now, the truth is, we did that in a rule a couple of weeks back, and we got it wrong. You would think, Mr. Speaker, this is uh, not the first time we've had to make up for the Senate's mistakes. You'd think as often as we've had to take up for those folks, we'd have figured out how to do it right. But sadly, we didn't get it quite right. And I hope we don't get in the habit of getting it right. I hope we get in the habit of actually passing a budget over there, bringing a budget to conference, and having a budget that controls all of Capitol Hill. But in an effort to make up for what's not happening there, we did absolutely in this rule that's before us today, Mr. Speaker, specify that the caps that we created, the 435 of us created in the budget that we passed, will be the caps that regulate the activity that the 435 of us engage in for the rest of the year. And I welcome the Senate to join in, in that debate. You know, to be, to be fair to my colleague from, from Florida, we just see the Budget Control Act differently. I think we both voted for the Budget uh, Control Act last uh, fall. I viewed it as budget caps. In fact, if you open up the legislation, it says budgetary caps. And when I read the word caps, Mr. Speaker, what I see is you can't spend any more of that. I was never under any illusion that I was obligated to spend absolutely all of it. And I candidly, I think that's one of the issues we have here in this body, Mr. Speaker. You may hear other speakers come down here today on the other side of the aisle who believe exactly that, that because we signed an agreement with the president that we would not spend a penny more than $1,047,000,000,000 this year, that we are in fact now obligated to spend every single penny of that $1,047,000,000. As we talked about, 40 cents out of every dollar that we spend in this town, Mr. Speaker, is borrowed borrowed from our children, from our grandchildren. Forty cents out of every dollar is money that we do not have, but we are borrowing against the next generation's prosperity to spend on our priorities today. My friend from Florida brings up the COPS program. You know, COPS program is a neat, neat program. It provides dollars to local law enforcement agencies to help them succeed in their local law enforcement mission. But the clever little secret that sometimes we don't talk about, Mr. Speaker, is that my community back home takes all the tax money out of their pocket. They send it to Washington, D.C. We don't have access to any money in my part of the world, my little 7th district there in, in uh, northeast Georgia. There's no money that we get back that we didn't send in to begin with. We can prioritize those local, control, those local priorities locally. We can control those outcomes locally. Forty cents out of every dollar we're borrowing. Not one budget. I, I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, that, that in this open process we allowed every member of Congress to bring any budget they wanted to to the House floor for debate and consideration. Not one of those budgets, not one, balanced next year. Not one. Not one budget. Some of, the, some of the brightest leaders I hope that our nation has to offer, Mr. Speaker, sit here in these chairs in this body, and not one of them had a proposal for how to right this ship next year. Not one. And so the question is what? Do we just quit trying? Do we just quit trying, Mr. Speaker? Do we just concede that the economic security of this nation is just going to drip, drip, drip away with deficit spending year after year after year? Are we going to concede that the 50% increase in the public debt that's occurred over the last four years is just the way it's going to be? That's a pattern that is going to continue instead of a pattern that needs to be stopped? But here's the good news. I have heartfelt feelings on that issue. My friend from Florida has heartfelt feelings on that issue. And the rule that we, from the Rules Committee, Mr. Speaker, my colleague from Florida and I have brought to the floor today, is going to open up that debate so that absolutely every member can have their passions and feelings heard on this issue. And one more uh, point of pride, Mr. Speaker, because I really do like coming down here on, on open rule uh, days. You know, what we don't talk about sometimes from that Budget Control Act is that those caps that $1,047,000,000 I mentioned earlier, the most that we could possibly spend, that's only good from October 1 to the first week of January because that very same agreement said that in the failure 
of the Joint Select Committee last fall to act, and I will tell you it was quite the failure. The failure of that committee to act was going to lead to 8% across the board reductions in every single account that we're talking about here on the floor today. 8% across the board reductions. What our budget does and what our caps do is recognize that failure, Mr. Speaker. Recognize that the House representatives on that Joint Select Committee, the Senate representatives on that Joint Select Committee, they did not come to agreement on deficit reduction. And thus, those caps, those 8% across the board reductions are barreling down the road towards this institution, Mr. Speaker, and picking up speed every day. Now, we can either tell the American people that all is well, and let's go ahead and spend the maximum amount possible, but oh, watch out. Here come those across the board cuts that nobody planned for, or we could do the responsible thing. And the responsible thing is to plan for that contingency. And I say contingency, I dare say, Mr. Speaker, it's almost a certainty that we're not going to find a way around those across the board cuts, but we can find a way around them with the budget that this institution passed. With the numbers that this institution passed, we can replace those revenues, replace that spending that was going to be saved with across the board cuts with targeted cuts. Targeted cuts to programs that we in this body agree on. Mr. Speaker, I didn't come to this body to do across the board cuts. There's good spending and there's bad spending. I didn't come to this body to, to use the meat axe to go after everything. I came to this body to set the priorities that my constituents sent me here to set. Far from being an abomination of the process, this House passed budget, this House reconciliation bill that's coming at the end of this week, and yes, this first appropriations bill, the FY 2013 cycle, it's the way this process is supposed to be done. I rise in strong support of this rule, Mr. Speaker, and I reserve the balance of my time. General reserves his time. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself uh, our time, and then we'll yield um, uh, to my friend from uh, California. Um, if we defeat the previous question, um, I'm going to offer an amendment uh, to the rule uh, to make sure uh, that we bring up um, uh, Mr. Tierney's um, uh, from Massachusetts bill to prevent a doubling of student loan interest rates fully paid for by repealing tax giveaways for big oil companies. Uh, to discuss our amendment to the rule, I'm very pleased at this time to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from California, the ranking member of the Education Committee, Mr. Miller. I thank the gentleman from Florida for, for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition to this rule. This rule provides for consideration of the Commerce Justice Appropriations, but it adds some extraneous matters, things like martial law and reconciliation. If we're going to consider other matters in this rule, we ought to be allowed, as the gentleman from Florida say, to be able to consider the question of doubling of the interest rates of student loans. The House Democrats months ago asked for it for this action to be taken so that interest rates would not double on students this July 1st, doubling from 3.4% to 6.8%, and when calls for bipartisanship were met with silence, silence and silence and silence for months. But all of a sudden, the Republicans in Congress started to understand this issue when President Obama took it to the parents and to the students of this country and explained to them was it, what it was at stake. And the, and the, and the, Two weeks ago, the Republicans uh, uh, surprised us with a bill on the floor where they said they all now agree with it, even though they voted against it two weeks earlier, that they agree that there shouldn't be a doubling of the student loan rates. But then what did they decide to do? They decided that the not doubling of the student loan rates, they gave the, the House a choice where they would take it out, they would take it out on, on women's health, denying women to early screening uh, for breast cancer, for cervical cancer, newborn infants for early screening for birth defects. That's that's how they decided they would pay for it. We tried to offer a democratic alternative, Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts legislation, that would have, would have taken away the unjustified, unfair tax breaks to the largest oil companies in, in the country at a time of record profits and used some of that money to pay for, the, uh, 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 for making sure that the uh, interest rates don't double. 
but the Republicans wouldn't allow us to offer that. And today what we're trying to do uh, is to defeat the previous question. So we'll be able to offer the, the, the Democratic substitute, which would keep the interest rates from doubling, pay for it by taking away the unfair tax cuts to the largest oil companies, and not do what the Republicans did, is to say you can have your student loan subsidy, but you're going to have to take it out of the hides of newborn infants, of children's immunization, and the, and the, and the, the preventative care. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for you. And the preventative Children's care and early screening minutes. for women with cervical and breast cancer, we know that that decision, that early screening, is a matter of life and death for those women. But that was of no matter to the Republicans. And now we see today a recent poll out that suggests that over half of the country supports the student loans not doubling, paying for it in the manner in which the Republicans did, as opposed to 30 percent of the country that think the Republicans are on the right track in going after women's health, children's health, children's immunization. So I would hope that we would defeat the previous question, and that Mr. Hastings will be allowed to move to consider the legislation by Mr. Tierney, and we can put this issue to rest, and families and students who are now sitting around trying to figure out how they're going to pay for the college education of their children who have just been accepted to college or continuing in college, they can do that with a peace of mind of knowing that the interest rates won't double on July 1st. I thank the gentleman for yielding. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume to say I've just gotten the sad news that our friends on the Senate side uh, hadn't just stuck it to us by not passing a budget last year, and didn't just stick it to us by not passing a budget this year, but have just stuck it to us one more time by failing to move forward on the student loan legislation there. I mean, I, I don't know what to do down here, Mr. Speaker. I mean, on the one hand, my colleagues say, rightfully so, that they don't want us just running on our own down here, doing our own thing all the time, present, pretending as if the Senate doesn't exist. But on the other hand, we've dealt with the student loan issue. We've preserved rates at their, at their current low levels, and the Senate can't get its work done. I don't know what more we can do. Folks are prepared to go over for a vigil outside the Senate chambers. I want you to put me on your invitation list. I'll go by there with you, and we'll see what we can do to shake things up over there. But those six-year term limits are not quite as effective at motivating action as two-year term limits uh, here, on the, here on the House side. Mr. Speaker, this bill before us today isn't actually about uh, student loans. You might not have, have uh, believed that listening to the last speaker, but it's about the Commerce Department. It's about the Justice Department. It's about science funding in this body. Now, the good news is we're going to be able to deal with all of these issues one by one by one. You know, I, I came to this uh, chamber, Mr. Speaker, wanting to move away from the 2,000-page bills that I'd seen in, in past Congress. I came to this chamber wanting to deal with one issue at the time, wanting to deal with things so you didn't have to vote for all or nothing, but so you could vote for the individual items that you actually believed in and vote against those items that you don't believe in. That's the process we have today. This is the first of a dozen different bills that are going to come down uh, through this chamber where folks will be able to offer amendments line item by line item. And if I didn't say it before, Mr. Speaker, I want to say it now. That's actually what can happen here. This isn't a take it or leave it proposition today. This rule, which again, I can't take all the, all the credit for. I was actually tied up in, a, in the reconciliation markup yesterday. My friend from, from Florida was actually as, as responsible as anyone for bringing a bill a rule to the floor that will allow every single line of the underlying bill to be considered by the 435 folks in this chamber. As you know, Mr. Speaker, you know, you have a subcommittee, and that's a small group of folks who know a lot about the issue on which they work. It's, this is the Commerce, Justice, Science uh, subcommittee over there. Then you have a full committee, and the full committee has a lot of really smart people who know a lot about their, their topic here. In this case, that's the Appropriations Committee, the full Appropriations uh, Committee, and of course they, they both pass that out by a voice vote. But if you're like me, Mr. Speaker, if you serve on the Budget Committee and the Rules Committee, you don't ever get a say in appropriations spending. A lot of really smart guys on that subcommittee, a lot of really smart men and women on that full committee, but what about my say? What about the 920,000 people that I represent, Mr. Speaker? And that's the solution that the Rules Committee brought out last night. They said, you have not gotten your say yet for the 7th District of Georgia, Mr. Woodall, but you will get it during this process. And not just you, but you and you and you and you, that every single member of this House, by virtue of the fact that they were elected by American citizens back home, will have the opportunity to come to this floor 
and have their voice heard. Mr. Speaker, this isn't a tough decision today. This is one of the proudest decisions we get to make in this House, and that is to have its membership work its will and report out the very best bill that we can, send that over to the Senate and see what happens next. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Mr. Gentleman Speaker, I'm, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes uh, to the distinguished gentleman from uh, Connecticut, uh, my good friend, Mr. Courtney. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule and to allow the tyranny uh, amendment to move forward, which would allow a real solution to the 53-day ticking time bomb for college students and middle-class families all across this country. Uh, today, literally, as we're standing here, high school seniors are getting notices in the mail about whether they've been admitted to college. Uh, students are now packing up and leaving for the end of the spring term, already thinking about next year. Financial aid offices are trying to plan with families about how to pay for next year's tuition, and yet what they have before them is a, is a situation where on July 1st, the rates will double from 3.4% to 6.8%. On July 23rd, the President of the United States stood on that podium and challenged Congress to avoid that rate increase from going through. And for three months, we had a Republican majority which stonewalled this issue. No bill, no markup, no hearing. I filed legislation the day after that speech. We have over 150 co-sponsors to permanently lock in the lower rate. And yet, as Mr. Miller uh, indicated, what we heard from the House Republicans was a bill uh, 10 days ago which bypassed committees, nothing from the Educational Workforce Committee, rammed through the Rules Committee, and paid for it in the most disgraceful, grotesque fashion, taking it out of a fund, wiping out a fund to pay for prevention of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, early childhood diseases. That is not a solution. The President made it clear when that you know, scam was presented that it would be vetoed immediately. It is a dead letter. It is time for us to, yes, debate a CGS appropriations bill, very important, but those kids, those families need a horizon before them as they deal with one of the most exciting and opportunities and challenges before them, which is how to pay for higher education. We should defeat this rule. We should allow a motion to go forward, which will defuse this ticking time bomb for middle class families all across America. It's push aside that joke of a bill that passed 10 days ago and get down to the business of addressing middle class families' needs and young people's needs to help solve the problems of this country and give them the Gentleman's opportunity to expired. see. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume to 